This is the vision. We just take for granted that every school has a learning platform. We take it for granted that learning doesn't stop when you go out the school gate. We take it for granted that parents have access to kids learning. We take it for granted that um, learners can support each other when they learn. The big transformation is schools and schooling stops being a geographically, temporally located in time activity. It makes learning all pervasive. Wherever you are, you can learn and you can engage in your learning. But these are some of the problems. Teachers don't want to be webmasters. They just want to do learning stuff online. One of the really annoying things is that it's terribly difficult to work as a single school. We don't know how this technology will pan out over the next three to five years. We looked around ourselves at various possible solutions and frankly, we didn't know what to do. The problems need to be overcome because the government wants the vision of virtual learning environments to be reality for all schools by 2008. Then we're going to uh, use another resource, a web link, which is further revision of electromagnetic radiation, and then hopefully at the end we'll have a short recap. Why? Well, even skeptics concede that VLEs transform learning. It's down towards the bottom of your post in there, Lewis. I find it interesting that Ford chooses to portray the church in this light, and it would be interesting to know whether Ford got any opposition from people due to this portrayal. I'm just wondering how Ford sort of was perceived by, yeah. especially by, you know, openly giving this view of the church. I, th I think that's a really good point to raise that. And pupils, for whom instant messaging and social networking are now simply second nature, expect online learning. It's really good because you can like comment on other people's and see what they thought of yours. Even if you thought yours was good, they might have thought it was bad. Other people's are sometimes like better than yours and you get inspired to do more. My favourite thing about it is you can like send messages to your friends and you're allowed to. <laughs> so the VLE question for schools is not if, it's how. How did Queen Elizabeth School in Kirby Lonsdale, Cumbria implement its VLE? Once people started talking about the actual potential to use a virtual learning environment for the purpose of actually developing students' learning, then I could see that it had huge potential for developing better communication between students and teachers, between teachers and teachers. And that was the most exciting part of it. It seemed to be offering a solution that simple email with attachments uh, and our intranet just wasn't offering. Recognising the potential of VLEs is arguably the easy bit. The hard bit is to take the plunge. Queen Elizabeth has been supported by Clio, Cumbria and Lancashire Education Online, two local authorities which work together to provide IT support for schools. It takes schools a while to implement and understand how they're going to implement this. And typically there are sort of two approaches. There's, there's the, the way maybe one member of staff who's very keen, very enthusiastic, and sort of becomes sort of almost like the champion of uh, the VLE in their school and, and sort of spreads the word from there. Or you get the sort of top-down approach where the leadership team take a much more strategic view and say, well, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it and everybody's going to be involved. And it swings and roundabouts. Mark McNulty became the school's VLE champion, and he was closely involved in perhaps the single most important decision any school will take, which VLE to choose. The story started many years ago, really, uh, with many of our colleagues wanting to do stuff on the web. They were fans, for example, of BBC Bite Size, and they wanted to take that approach into their own teaching. We tried to make them webmasters, in themselves. But teachers don't want to be webmasters, they just want to do learning stuff online. We wanted to move away from doing things piecemeal with high technical skills. We needed something that was going to make the process easier. Teacher can do web stuff in an easy way. We looked for various ways of doing this and we ended up with Moodle. Moodle has one big advantage over the main commercial suppliers of other VLEs. The software is open source and therefore free. It's also been extensively tested out in schools. The 14 to 19 um, partnership in Cumbria had done quite a lot of work looking at a whole range of VLEs and they had a group of schools trying out the VLEs 
and the one that they favoured in the end was Moodle. So both counties pretty much working together through CLEO came to the unanimous decision that if they were going to offer a learning platform, they didn't want to put in something that they were unsure of. They were happy with what Moodle had been offering and being open source, so there was no licence requirements initially, we felt that it was certainly a good toe in the water, certainly initially. Um, as it's turned out, I think it's really evolved into being incredibly popular. Um, and in such a short space of time, really. Too good to be true? Well, perhaps. It's widely acknowledged that while the software is free, the support isn't. And the software simply won't work as well as it can unless it's supported. Yeah, because I, that also then it would help me resource it as to which are the, the good webcams to use because then you could have teacher here, Deming, class sitting at desks yeah. in classroom watching it on the, on the projector screen and free up the space better. I would caution any school, and I don't frankly care whether you're using Moodle or Digital Brain or Kaleidos or any of the products out there. Me as a teacher, frankly, I don't care what the brand name is. I just want to know, can it do stuff for me in a classroom? We've been lucky that we had Clio to give us the kind of backup that we needed. But it's the same for any school, anywhere in the country, whatever you're using. You need that comfort blanket. You don't if you're an alpha geek. If you're the kind of teacher who really knows their onions, fine, get on and do it. But people like me need that comfort blanket. And it was really, really important. So I'd say to any school, before you take the leap with your VLE, your learning platform, you want to find out what the comfort blanket is. We've got it through Clio. You may get it from a commercial provider. Don't sign up for anything until you know what that service level agreement is going to deliver in terms of support. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Bechter offers guidance to schools about to invest in a VLE. It's approved a group of suppliers able to offer schools software and support. Moodle is not on the list. I do have a concern. The concern I have is that um, what doesn't work, what isn't in the best interest in schools in the long term, is they get into overly hand-knitted solution to things, things that depend on an individual enthusiast in a school driving something and keeping it going. Schools aren't IT places, they shouldn't be, they're learning places. So we've got a clear role in saying, what kind of functions should these things offer? What kind of services should sit around them so that people genuinely can use them 24 hours a day? What's attractive around the Clio model is it's got the right kind of support. So it isn't just an enthusiast in the school getting a piece of software up and running. It's the backup that people need. And that's not just sort of technical support, it's pedagogical support. You know, what are you going to actually use this for in your geography lessons? Some of that kind of stuff. Um, so that's probably where I am on it. Um, great product, but I don't think it's always helpful when people think in terms of products. Anybody who's bought a mobile phone knows that you need to think about the total range of services that are on offer and how they're delivered and how sustainable that'll be and how reliable that will be over time. Not just the shiny little thing that you happen to be holding in your hand at the time. It's not about the te technology. What this is about is helping kids learn in new ways. And there are lots of examples of this. But the key thing is, it's not technology. It's about teaching and learning. Forget the nerdery, focus on that. You probably do need some kind of special person at the heart of it all who, who has really got a torch for learning um, as, a, as opposed to a torch for technology. The teacher who takes the lead in implementing a VLE will inevitably be an evangelist. What if other members of staff initially don't share the same enthusiasm? I was at a training event with really rather sceptical teachers from our area and they asked me this precise question, what do you do with colleagues who aren't into it? And I was kind of fumbling around for an answer and a guy in the audience came up with a, a brilliant expression and he said, Japanese gardeners say, don't water the rocks. And I think that sums up beautifully the way that you should approach this. Go to the colleagues who are up for it. The ones who aren't, you know, for entirely defensible reasons. These guys who are not up for Moodle, it doesn't make you a bad teacher. In fact, they could be brilliant teachers. That's why they don't need to change their practice. Don't get their backs up by trying to thrust something new down their throat. Go to the people who are up for it. They're your potential early adopters. They're your potential winners. Stick with them. But the early adopters will have to face some hard facts. The workload button is a really sensitive button. You know, 
you might as well buy a cheap gun and shoot yourself, frankly, as to start messing or increasing with people's workload. They, they just don't want it. You, you've got to really approach it carefully. There is an unavoidable overhead at first. And the first thing anybody in a position like I'm in must do is to be candid with colleagues. It's going to mean, mean more work. There's no way around them. Don't try and dress it up as some, something else. What you have to do is to give them an idea of what the outcome might be. The obvious advantage of open source software is that schools don't have to pay licensing costs. The savings can be invested in staff training. They wanted to ensure that schools were supported well um, and that we didn't just go out and buy some software and put it in and, and nobody would necessarily know how to use it or what to do with it. So the other key aspect is that we've tried to develop right from the start is a very good training programme. And now we've got to the point where both local authorities have a number of consultants who deliver the training. So we put a lot of energy into that, a lot of energy into creating um, good quality courses. And we're still learning on that, but, you know, I think so far things are going very well and the courses are now proving really, really popular. Um, and we're able, because we've spent less money perhaps on licensing, to offer some of that, that training free. Queen Elizabeth's is well ahead of the game in VLEs. It's already learned many of the lessons that other schools still have to face. Mark McNulty believes that the technical, financial and pedagogical factors involved in the choice of a VLE are in many ways quite straightforward. What's much more complex and difficult to predict is the future development and use of the platforms. I think this is a grey area. And we all need to be quite candid about this and quite honest with ourselves as educational practitioners. The commercial vendors will tell you that their system will work interoperably with just about anything and is, to use the jargon, future proof. I'm not sure that that's the case. I think we all have to recognise what you might call our known unknowns about the use of VLEs and learning platforms. We don't know how this technology will pan out over the next three to five years. In the short term, it's reasonably clear, but in the medium to long term, these things are not that clear. So we had to address these issues as a school with our leader leadership team and make the case and be open about the fact that we didn't exactly know how it would pan out. Bechter would like to see more cooperation between open source software developers and the big commercial providers. What I'd like to see as we, as we go down is more and more people coming forward offering services to schools that are taking things like open source content, software, whatever, and saying, yeah, and we'll support this. We'll support this. So what you're getting is a completely packaged service here, which means that we'll look after it when it falls over, if it falls over. We'll help take the risk out of some of this because there are risky sort of things associated with high-stake things like kids' exam work or whatever. It's about people who can provide that service and us trying to encourage schools to think about what service do I need rather than what product do I want.